Hey, everybody, it's the Drive to School podcast. I am Pastor Goodman, your host, and uh, my buddy David Zills is back. How you been? Hey, but doing okay. Um, survived uh, the fall, and now I'm trying to survive the winter. There's really cold weather out this window, and everybody is dropping like flies with sickness, so I'm just trying to kind of put one foot in front of the other right now. Yeah, it has been cold as we have recorded this, um, and so it, it seems to be the thing that that's captured everybody's attention. My kids are at school for like the first time in a week, and uh, yeah, it's it's been a thing. Um, <laughs> so we 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 talked a lot last season last year uh, about sort of apologetics uh, about intellectual arguments to to defend the faith uh, that it is actually pretty reasonable to to believe in this stuff. Um, but I, I think today we're going to shift gears just a little bit uh, and talk about deconstruction, which is a big word. So we'll, we'll maybe define it first, but then we'll, we'll start to unpack why. So, uh, David, what, what is deconstruction and, and how does it apply to, to Christians or former Christians? Yeah, well, um, I think if you're on social media, you see deconstruction, ex-evangelicals, you know, a lot of this um a lot of these trends, and it's. Uh, I think there's a lot to it. There's a lot of feelings built up around it on all sides. There's a lot of hurt, um, and I think it's important that the church um, take a hard look at itself, honestly, in response to some of this stuff, and, and consider carefully how to respond to this movement um, in a way that reflects the heart of God. But I think, you know, if you're going to define deconstruction, it kind of is a self-defining word, but it's applied to your faith. So it's like you have the scaffolding of your faith and you tear part of it down. Now, maybe you don't tear all of it down. Maybe you just tear part of it down. So maybe, you know, one person, it looks different for everybody. One person might say, you know, I grew up in this very legalistic church culture and I tore down the legalism, but not the rest of the faith. You know, I'm still a Christian. Or maybe they tear it down and replace it with something else, or maybe they leave the faith altogether. So it looks different for everybody, but it's this idea that you have faith and you have this structure that you kind of had for a good chunk of your life, maybe as a young person and then going into college or 20s. It can happen at any time, but then at some point something happens and you look at it and you're like, I'm not so sure this really works for me. I don't know that this makes sense. Or often it's coming from a place of hurt and you're like, I can't associate this deep hurt with things of God. And so I can't, I can't accept that aspect of my faith anymore because it just doesn't fit with what I think life is supposed to be like. And so it's this idea of tearing down part of your faith, maybe all of your faith, maybe you rebuild it with something else. Maybe you end up as a stronger Christian because you grew closer to God through kind of questioning some stuff that honestly needed to be questioned and dealing with some hurt that honestly God was angry about too. But there's a spectrum of it, but it all has to do with um, it can be doubt related intellectual, but often it's, it's very emotional or, um, coming from a, a place of deep hurt or, um, confusion around hurt. Right. And so, uh, it, it warrants nuance for a couple of reasons. Um, you mentioned that this is sort of an emotional response to, to problems in the church rather, uh, than, than chiefly an intellectual one, although the, the, the intellect certainly plays a role in it. Um, but, but a lot of times, uh, when people are deconstructing their faith, it's, it's in response to what they, they view as something that, that is deeply unjust that is happening within the institution of their church. Um, it, it happens with, with, um, abuse that goes, uh, that that goes unaddressed. It it happens with with legalism that is is in a lot of cases weaponized. You, you, there are people who who feel wronged by the church and therefore by God. And, and so whenever the emotions are involved, I, I think that there should be a little bit of nuance, just because like our emotions uh, when it comes to these kinds of things get so big so fast that we're willing to paint with very broad brushes um, on one side and on and on the other uh, inside of the church. Whenever anybody starts poking at the institution, the institution gets its guard up and uh, sometimes wants to say, well, two things are happening here. First, people are leaving the faith. So the whole deconstruction movement is evil. And, and second, there are no problems with the institution. Don't question that or you're questioning God. And both of those are, are sort of very dangerous assumptions that, that in a lot of cases sort of further the movement where it, it, it it's not healthy. So let, let's unpack this stuff just a little bit. Um, talk to me about, about sort of the institution itself and uh, where, where that sort of differs from God. Yeah, well, I, you see this going all the way back to the time of Jesus. I mean, you have 
Jesus was very critical of the religious institutions because um, he, he would affirm, interestingly enough, Jesus, um, when you look theologically at all the different Jewish sects around in Jesus' day, the you know Pharisees, Sadducees, blah, 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 the ones Jesus aligned with most on a theological level was the Pharisees, which is interesting because they're also the ones he's most critical of. So he said, you know, you got a lot of these finer um, abstract points correct, but when it comes to the heart of it all, you're totally missing the heart of God. And he says, you know, you you put these burdens on people's backs and aren't willing to lift a single finger to help them. And, and you know, you misrepresent God with all your hypocrisy and stuff like that. So I think, you know, the idea that religious institutions can be places where sin runs rampant is nothing new. I mean, that's just part of human nature. And it's very sad that, you know, in, in wanting to draw close to God, people can misuse that to hurt people. Like, it's very sad. But uh, the, the fact of the matter is these institutions are made of people. And if you believe you, that people are fundamentally sinful and self-focused and, um, you know, aren't inherently good, then it shouldn't be a surprise that when people um, come together around a common cause that there can be things that get twisted. I mean, it just happens. It doesn't just happen in religious institutions. It happens in any institution. I mean, you can see it all over in politics these days. I mean, uh, that's a topic for another time, but as uh, you know, people can get, get latch on to a cause and um, feel that it gives them meaning and purpose, but then miss the heart of what this is all about and, that their sinfulness can cause them to create deep hurt. And um, yeah, so it's the, 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 the fundamental matter is human institutions are human institutions. They're not God's kingdom on earth. And sometimes God's kingdom clashes with human institutions, even human institutions that claim to be representing God. And Jesus did that back in his day, and it continues all the way to today. Right. I think there's an important distinction between the institution and the church. And so as, as Lutherans, we talk about the visible church and the invisible church. And, and we sort of use this dichotomy to address the invisible church is, is the faithful on earth and in heaven right now. Uh, and there, there is no sin because Jesus forgives it all. And in the visible church, uh, well, you pack a whole bunch of sinners into a box and you put a cross on the top of it. And you, you probably shouldn't be surprised when when they're sinners, uh, but we are every single time. Um, and, and there, the, the church, the visible church is sort of marked by the, the preaching of the word and its truth and purity and the administration of the sacrament. So I know I'm in church, not because the people are awesome and there are no problems here, but because Jesus is forgiving sinners. The institution is, is the system that's set up to perpetuate the institution. The, the institution exists to keep on surviving. Um, and so uh, we, we belong to uh, the Lutheran Church Misery Synod, uh, w which is a, a place where I want to be, even though it is sinful, because it exists to train up new pastors, to produce uh, books for us to, to study that, that help us further understand the Word of God, to, to sort of organize that this chaos that would be a whole bunch of sinners and a whole bunch of boxes, all with crosses on top, uh, around a common cause. And it's going to be messy. It's just, it's going to be messy. So I, I think we need to walk the line then between sort of wanting an institution simply because we need some organization of this chaos versus sort of rubber stamping anything the institution does. You know what I mean? Yeah. And that's, that's a tricky one because um, mm. that's really tricky because uh, different institutions have glaring issues that some people are more sensitive to than others. Um, and so it can be hard in some cases to say, well, there's this very obvious problem in this institution that really hurt me. So how do I get past that? And the answer is maybe you don't, maybe you go somewhere else. I mean, maybe that's just what you need at that point. Um, but I, I think, you know, there's another um, point here, which is even within those who are genuine Christians, um, we still have the sin nature. And that's where I think you know, there's this, I think on both sides, there can be this side on the, the, those within the church to get defensive. Um, and I think sometimes it's actually worth taking a hard look and, you know, Jesus always calls us to repentance and there might be some valid points here where we need to look and say, yeah, we're not reflecting the heart of God. And that, that, that grieves God and we get called to repentance and, and we need to ask for forgiveness there. And then I think on the other side, um, understanding that 
um, the body of Christ is um, something that Jesus created when he ascended into heaven. And it's this, um, it's the connection of all the people who are, who are saved and are following him. And we're not perfect, but we're walking together and we need that camaraderie. We need um, to be building each other up. We need that fellowship. And so to not abandon that, but um, yeah, there's a, there's a lot there with the, with the institutional side of things. Um, I think, um, yeah, I think there's a lot there to unpack. You uh, you mentioned one word that that's really really important. It's repentance. Um, Luther said our, our our whole life as Christians should be a life of repentance, and, and deconstriction really gets its wheels moving when the church itself wants to sort of move past repentance and into something else. Um, there's there's abuse in the church, and that is absolutely always all the time unacceptable. There's never a place where we sort of say, well, it was for a greater good or, or you know, you can't make an omelet without ruining a few Christians lives or anything like that. Uh, abuse in the church is never OK. And if the entire life is one of repentance, that means that when abuse is, is acknowledged, when it's raised, when it's when it's out there, the response should not be blame or or, 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 or uh, fighting over or, you know, the, the best. Uh, con- it, it should be repentance. It, it, yeah. And, and I think there's there's a couple levels of repentance. I mean, obviously, um, we talk. It's easy to think about individual repentance. Like I did this thing against this other person. I need to repent. I need to make it right with them. But I think there's this other aspect of repentance, which is honestly harder and thornier, and that's institutional repentance. You know, I think of when Ravi Zacharias, who was this, um, you know really impactful apologist. And, and there were some things that came out um, that, there, that there seemed to be some um, backed up allegations of some things he had done that were quite honestly unacceptable and very hurtful and did, did not shed good light on his ministry. I remember his organization, he had died at that point, but the organization that was in his name came out and said, we need to do institutional repentance because we allowed this to happen. And I think there's something from for leadership. You know, I saw this uh, leadership reel the other day by someone who said the hardest part of leadership is realizing that whatever happens, it's your fault. And, mm-hmm. you know, if you, it's easy to point the finger and say, well, they did that. But if you're in a position of leadership, you have a responsibility to do something about it. And so I think that's the very hard thing is for leaders to say, well, to look a hard look in the mirror and say, what did we do that allowed this to happen? But I think there's a deeper point here. And I think this just cuts right across all of this because you can talk about people are sinful. You can talk about repentance. You can talk about all this. And at the end of the day, it's still very hurtful when people do bad things, especially when they do them in a way that seems to be representing God. And I think the thing that is most important in all of this is to know what God's heart is. And God's heart is that, like you said, this is unacceptable. He is grieved by sin anywhere, whether it's done by people who claim to represent God or people who don't. He is grieved by sin everywhere, and he gets angry about it. You know, you look at Jesus and how he got angry at the injustice that was being done in the temple when people were using the temple sacrificial system as a way to make um, unjust profits. And he said, you're exploiting people by using religion. This is wrong. And he got angry and drove them out. You know, this is God's heart. He says, anywhere that you are doing something that puts a barrier between some a person and Jesus, Jesus gets really upset. And anytime you do something that hurts someone, especially that hurts them deeply in a play in their soul, because it touches a spiritual nerve, Jesus is angry. God is angry. Um, and knowing that that is God's heart is that you, you don't have to look at that and say, well, I'm the one on the outside because the church has wronged me and therefore I should just leave. But knowing, no, God invites you to come in and say, yeah, this is wrong. I feel it too. You know, don't run from me, even though you might have to have healthy boundaries with certain institutions or certain people. You know, I think it boundaries are important and we don't talk about them enough in the church as part of healthy relationships. And sometimes you need boundaries where there's been hurt so that you don't keep getting hurt. But what we shouldn't do is assume that the boundaries we need to keep from getting hurt with other people, we also need with God. And part of that is understanding what the heart of God is. And so I think in all of this, it's essential not to lose the heart of God, which is he is 
deeply, deeply hurt and offended by injustice anywhere, especially when it touches people in a spiritual way or any deep way. Um, and so I think that that's critical not to lose sight of that. Right, that that God actually despised the the injustice so so profoundly that the only answer that he could possibly come up with besides burning the entire earth to the ground it was dying on the cross, not just for the victims to to save them from their shame and their misery, to bear it himself and then tie them to the honor of the resurrection, but even also to forgive the perpetrators so that there can be a home in the church for sinners, be they the ones sinned against or the ones doing the sinning because we we sort of just take turns doing that sin perpetuates more sin that perpetuates more sin Um, and if all we really have is running from a place where we were sinned against we're going to run out of places where we can ever find any hope real real fast and i think that's actually the devil's goal behind this thing and and it's easy to to look at the church as a hopeless place because there's nothing but the same ugly news stories over and over again uh, because we're the same kind of sinners that we have been since the fall The, the answer is never just sort of deal with it. Uh, it, it. It's always Jesus has to bear the cross for this, and and the life lived has to be one of repentance for the the, the sinner and, and and mercy for the, the sinned against. Uh, when when we talk about this, then we get to recognize that that if God has promised to locate Himself in a place. And he has. He he has promised that if you want to deal with me, it's going to be where my word is preached and my sacraments are administered. The devil's obviously going to to put up any wall that he can, either externally uh, or or even just internally in your heart, towards you going to the place where God is handing out mercy. Um, there might be a, a, a different congregation that needs to be gone to. Um, there there might need to be an, an, a, a large scale addressing of an institution. But I, I think sort of one thing that that God has actually promised to remain steadfast, even while He cleans out the institutions. In, in the Old Testament, you have Jesus, you know, cleansing the temple is it's so that the temple can still be the temple. Like you're not supposed to to raise the temple. Jesus tears down the temple, but he raises it up again in three days uh, because he actually wants there to be a, a church where there is preaching for sinners, not just the ones who are sinners like me who have never done anything wrong, but, but sinners like you who have done bad things that you can't come like that. That's ridiculous. And, and instead, we have a, a Jesus who who actually spends a lot of time arguing even with the Pharisees because he wants them in the temple. He just he doesn't want the abuse. Yeah, and I think a related thing here, um, which is another topic for another day, but it's the idea of emotional intelligence and emotional safety, mm-hmm. because there's a lot of well-meaning Christians who say things that can be really hurtful because they're very shallow or they're dismissive or things like that. And I think part of emotional intelligence is emotional safety. And part of having healthy boundaries is knowing who's emotionally safe and who's not. And there may be some people you need to say, you know, it's not healthy for me to talk about spiritual things with them because they don't have the maturity or the safety for me to address that. Or they may there may be congregations where there's just a lot of stuff going on there that, you know, it's not a healthy place for me to meet with God. And so uh, learning to discern who's emotionally and spiritually safe and who's not, I think is really important because everybody's on a different journey of repentance. And some people are in a healthier place where they can invite others in to walk alongside them in those in those journeys. And the thing I'd say is if you've been burned by one person, number one, or one institution, number one, know that that's not God. And number two, know that God has other people out there who are able to work, walk with you and look for them in other congregations or institutions or, or gatherings of people. And so don't lose hope because God, like you said, God is angry at this and God also promises to perpetuate, you know, his, the body of Christ on earth, which is, which is, you know, the group of, of believers, those who are following Jesus in repentance and look for those people who are safe, who can walk with you because there can be a lot of healing and realizing that that experience I had with that one person or that one group isn't universal. There are other people who actually are healthy and safe and, and have some emotional and spiritual maturity who can walk with me without creating the same wounds and all that. So I think, I think, you know, Rather than saying a blanket statement of like the church is sinful, but the church is good, I think there's like there's there's some texture to it. There are some places that are more toxic and there are some places that are more healthy. And I think it's helpful to have some discernment and to know who your who are your safe people are that you can go to with this stuff. Um and also to remember that behind it all, there's a God who's totally safe, who will never 
let us down, who will never hurt us in the deepest places out of spite or because he's insecure or because he misunderstands, you know, what's good. And so I think those are some things to keep in mind is remember the heart of God and know that God's got people out there who are in a good spot, who can walk with you and persevere to, to find them. That was just the perfect nuance that I needed to hear. David, thank you so much for hanging out this morning. Yeah, yeah. All right, we'll talk again soon, I hope. Take care, man. Okay, sounds good. Yep, bye-bye.